Welcome to the Future is Borderless podcast with David Nilsson. We feature top entrepreneurs and thought leaders from around the world, those who bring a global mindset and a unique perspective to their life and business. Now, let's get started with the show. Hey, David Nilsson here. I am the host of this podcast. Uh, on the Future is Borderless, we connect with business leaders from around the world that have what I like to think about as a borderless mindset. And this is, you know, the idea for us to get together is to share ideas, new innovations, uh, and best practices, things that will help power growth in our personal and professional lives uh, so that we can thrive in a rapidly changing world. Now, this episode is brought to you by Doxa Talent. Doxa helps businesses source full-time, highly skilled workers from all over the world. And as a result, these companies can scale faster, increase margin, and improve culture. If you'd like to learn more about how to grow your business with offshore talent, simply visit doxatalent.com. All right. Well, today's show is going to be really interesting uh, because we're going to be talking about social media, uh, something that I think we're all participating in, but few of us do very well. Um, my guest today is Jason Yorkman. He's the founder of Socialistics, which is a social media agency that helps businesses turn their social media efforts into real measurable results. And over the last 20 years, he's launched and managed social media efforts for companies like Microsoft, uh, Mac, the Air Force, uh, Habitat for Humanity, and many, many others. Jason's been recognized as a thought leader in B2B social media uh, and also an influencer. And he recently published a book called Anti-Agency, A Realistic Path to a Million Dollar Business. Jason, uh, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Well, I I'm actually curious just to understand sort of the genesis behind uh, your career and in particular interest in social media. So when did you first sort of realize that this is something that you loved enough that you wanted to make a career out of it? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I kind of fell into it a little bit. I, you know, really the 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 moment that my career, um, the 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 tipping point for me was um, Microsoft. I originally was from Chicago, and I'm in Seattle now. So back in 2005, I got a job at Microsoft, um, which is a you know a pretty um, you know buttoned up way of it's it's a long it was a long process, but ultimately I landed there and moved to Seattle for Microsoft and got there around 05. And this is right when Facebook was still only colleges pretty much right around then and i i was there for search marketing and uh based on my memory i just remember being fascinated by like this up and coming platform called facebook and just kind of naturally gravitated towards it and at microsoft one of the great things is you can really kind of jump around internally and, and have different jobs and whatnot so Within a year or two of doing what I was doing, I ended up on what was called the community team, which was just a generic way of, of basically referencing social media at the time. So I we were tasked with kind of evangelizing Microsoft advertising and doing it through social media efforts, content creation, those sorts of things, and really just started getting going. But really what turned it around for me is I got laid off from Microsoft uh, a few years later, which was the first time that they had ever laid anybody off. And I was in panic mode. Um, now they gave me a great severance package. So I had time to figure things out, but uh, now I was, I had moved to this foreign land for this job dream job. And now, now what am I going to do? I wrote an article about being laid off. It got picked up and I got tons of traffic to my goofy website at the time. <laughs> and I just clicked in my head. I'm like, oh my God, I have to do something with all of this attention. So I quickly reconfigured my website and I just doubled down on figuring out how to build a personal brand and how to gain as much following as I could on Twitter. And for the next year, I just and I just put out content and I talked about marketing and I talked about social media and I figured out every single method I could to build the biggest following I could and built my Twitter following up to past 50,000. And all of this effort got Microsoft's attention again. And they ended up hiring me back, um, which I thought was the goal. And then I had a different job there and didn't like it. And I'm like, oh crap, now what am I going to do? This isn't really what I wanted. And then parlayed that into my next role, which was basically a director of social media at an agency. And that's when that path basically was established. So ever since then, social media has just kind of been my sweet spot in terms of navigating it for agencies and businesses and knowing how to do it well and leading teams. And that's just been my calling card. So, you know, certainly a lot of it had to do with passion, but 
I think it was more just I was right place, right time, doing the right things and becoming a subject matter expert and 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 being able to open doors around that sort of thing. So that's really, you know, where it all kind of came from. Super interesting that they laid you off. And as a result of that, you started doing something that got you rehired. And I love that yeah. you call um, Seattle this foreign land. Um, yeah. Having yeah. been from, you know, I'm from Seattle, so I, I love this to, city. To me, it was at the time, for sure, because I grew up in the Midwest. So, but not now, now Seattle's home. So uh, <laughs> certainly not foreign to me anymore. Yeah. Now you said you, you became a director of social media with an agency, but today you own your own agency, Socialistics. Mm-hmm. How did you make the jump? And, and when did you decide it was time for you to just venture out on your own? Yeah, great question. So I've always been an entrepreneur, I think my entire life without realizing it. I always struggled with being managed. Uh, And a lot of that just had to do with crappy managers, to be honest. Uh, I think I've only had one good one in my entire career. Um, But I move fast and I like to get things done and I get really frustrated with anything that gets in the way. And so one of the things that was frustrating at Microsoft uh, was, you know, the meetings to talk about other meetings and just the, the it's like turning the Titanic trying to get anything done sometimes. And that's not to say it's always like that, but um, I move lightning fast, usually too fast for most people. And I take big swings and I miss, uh, but I just find that my ability to be successful has a lot to do with taking risks and moving quickly um and the good outweighs the bad so i i think i was always a square peg in a round hole when it came to working for somebody else and you know my personal life really didn't allow for that leap or risk at least from my mindset you know having young children and bills and like i can't i can't do my own thing i need health benefits and i need stability and all of these things and it wasn't until you know it just i, I had reached a breaking point in my life where Um, I had an aha moment where I finally realized that the stability that I was always looking for was right in front of me the whole time, which was doing my own thing. I just, the fear was preventing me from tapping into what was possible. And a lot of it had to do with, you know, I created a runway for myself. I I built socialistics in the background when I still had another job. I thought to myself, well, I feel I could kind of see the writing on the wall I think I can make this more realistic. Can I get the train moving? Can I create some momentum with a brand and start creating content and creating some demand so that if and when I want to take that leap, I'm not jumping in cold. There's a there's it's already in motion. And sure, lo and behold, the last job that I had, something happened, I was done, and I was like, I'm done with this. Like it's clear that working for somebody else is not working for me. So I jumped into that moving train and have never looked back since because it just it clicked in my mind, creating that runway. And then I haven't looked back since. Everything has grown since then. And, and now, you know, I'm starting a second business. And um, and the book is, uh, I just gave you the short version of really how the book starts. And that's the whole passion project behind the book around why I did what I did, how I did it, and how somebody that didn't have any resources or investors did it from scratch. And and a lot of it is just mindset and uh, and just doing some tactical things that can put you in a position to take that leap. Yeah, I love it. We'll we'll dig into the book here in a few minutes because I do sure. think it's important to sort of think about, to sort of tell the story, the difference between raising capital and bootstrapping a business. My my first company, we bootstrapped. My second one, we actually ended up taking on some investment uh, and it's very different, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so I, I do want to talk, I want to dig into that a little bit, but I want to keep on the track of socialistics for a second because I think a lot of the people that listen to this podcast are people that... Um, probably are in a place that you described a minute ago, which is like, Hey, I've got a job. I'm afraid that if I, if I take this leap, it might be this catastrophic, uh, financial event, or, uh, you know, maybe I end up just becoming unemployable because I've been a business owner before I always tease people, but this is the club, right? Once you've done it now you're unemployable, but uh, you know, take me back and uh, the, the, the most common question would be like, what would you give people as advice if they were starting their own business? But I'd actually like to flip that and say, what did you learn as a new business owner that you'd want other people to understand? I think the biggest thing is that you have to understand. To me, the the real currency and um, real currency is is trust and likability. So I knew 
Now it's, it's a little, if you're, you know, if you're building and you're going to sell widgets and you're selling, that's a little bit different than if you're going to have like a service model or selling a digital product, but regardless, people buy things or get into partnerships with people that they trust and they like. So for me, I knew that, look, I want to start this social media agency. Um, I don't need it to make money right away because I have a job. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to build this brand. I'm going to put it out in the world. I'm going to create content. I'm going to talk about what I'm experiencing professionally. I'm going to be helpful to people. I'm going to put out this content and I'm going to build a brand and I'm going to put it out there and I'm going to maybe take a couple of clients on the side and maybe do it for free to build up my portfolio or do it at a, a highly discounted rate because I don't care about the money as much as I care about building credibility um, and creating some momentum around building a brand. So to me, like if you're somebody that can't take that leap completely financially, that should be your focus. Like, look, everybody's busy and everybody's got life, but you, everybody can find and carve out enough time to plant some seeds and create some momentum towards that leap. If you don't have a lot of money or you can't take that risk, come up with a name, build a website, write blog posts, do a podcast, do video, whatever it is that you enjoy doing. You have something of value. Put it out in the world and create some momentum. All of these signals that you put out, either through social media or through search, these things matter. It took, you know, we're six years in now. Everything that I and we have done has led us to a path of now, organically, we get people that reach out to us, that find us. Yeah. So I built a pipeline and it all started with that first year planting those seeds. So everybody can do it. You could start a website and you can put stuff out there very inexpensively. It's your time. So just doing those things and having realistic expectations about what you get out of it up front, as long as you're you're smart about it and realize that you're you're building a foundation, you're building trust, you're building likability. And these are the things that are going to get you to, whether it's six months, eight months, 12 months down the road, a place where, look, something's going to happen. You might get laid off, you might get fired, or you might get so fed up with the situation that you're in. Well, imagine if you sunk in 12 months of this effort of this moving train, now taking that leap doesn't feel as heavy. Hey, I've got this going. I'm getting people that are inquiring about it. I can take this leap now and I'm not starting from scratch. So, you know, for me that it took me a while to figure that out, you know? So to me, that is probably the biggest reason why I am where I am today is because I invested that time and had that sort of mindset um, to allow myself to put myself in a position who doesn't have investment money and all this to jump in and feel, have the mindset to go into it, um, and, and do well with it. Yeah. I, I love that. There, I think whenever I, I talk to sort of aspiring entrepreneurs, uh, or I talk to someone who's just started, a lot of times it feels like they're trying to boil the ocean at one time yep. uh, versus like, hey, over time you can build. So like to your point, start with a blog. You can always add the podcast later. If you have the podcast, now you can create long form content that can be distributed in different ways. So like, I, I love the sort of the simplicity behind that message. Sure. Um, let's jump into social media now for just a second, a, more, a little more tactical. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I've I've been asked many, many times, and I don't know if I could articulate, I know what we use and I know why I use it, but I don't know if I could explain it well. When somebody says to you, hey, which of these platforms are right for me? You said you started on Twitter. That was sort of a big focus for you. But like, you know, when you're working with these different businesses and help them figuring out their social media strategy, how do you determine like which platform is the right one to start with? Well, the first thing, if they come to me and ask that question, I say, well, you're asking the wrong question. I would, I always go back to, um, you know, the, the, one of my favorite questions to ask, uh, I, I ask this in interviews when I'm interviewing, um, you know, folks for our team, or if I'm, you know, pitching or, or having introductory calls with clients is imagine you hired us uh, six months from now. Uh, imagine you hired us six months from now, you're going, you're wrapping things up on a Friday and you're thinking to yourself, man, hiring social logistics is one of the best decisions we've made as a business. What would need to have happened over those six months for you to feel that way? Like what does success look like to you when you think about your social media? And that gets them into a mindset of, well, these things need to happen. And typically answers to those questions are anything from, you know, more sales, more leads, driving more traffic, you know, all of those ancillary things. But ultimately we, at, we get to the root of what really is uh, the answer, which is what 
needs to happen for you to feel like this investment and time and money is worth it to you. And once we can determine what that is real, and sometimes those answers are very unrealistic. Like they'll have this, but they want this. And, you know, we got to reel them in. When we get to a place eventually where it's like, okay, here's our budget, or here's what we have to work with. Here's our goals and objectives. Then from there, that's going to determine what channels are the priority. Because in most cases, and this is not so much the case anymore because we're working with larger businesses, but still, um, they can't be, they can't do everything. They don't have the budget. I mean, they do, but they're not willing to necessarily you you know increase their budget enough. But so we have to make prioritized choices. Yeah. You know, it's better. And this this is one of my philosophies. It's better to be great at less than average at everything. Don't take what you have and spread it out so thin across so many things because you're not going to create any momentum for yourself. Let's figure out what are the channels that make the most sense based on your target demographic that you're going after, the type of content that we're going to create and what your goals and objectives are and what your ad budgets are and all these sorts of things then lead us to this channel and this channel make the most sense because of that. And then we double down and get those right. And then typically what happens is we create that momentum, we create success and they're like, okay, let's take a look at this other channel now, now that we've seen and proved that this works and we can look at other channels to kind of consist of, but Ultimately, it's always comes down to what I used to call the big four, but now the big three. I mean, most of our companies that we're working with are, you know, it's a combination of Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and TikTok. You know, obviously Twitter slash X is kind of like, you know, in a, in a weird place right now. So, but typically, you know, it, it's those um, in, in some fashion, usually uh, one or two of those uh, based on, you know, whether they're B2B or B2C. So that's what gets us to the channel selection. Yeah. And then, and I'm surprised though. Um, I don't think if, if, unless I, I missed it and I apologize if so, but I don't think I heard Instagram or Pinterest. Yeah. Yet. Instagram. Uh, I should have said that if I didn't, but um, okay. yeah, we do a little bit of Pinterest. Pinterest is really, we find um, it's rare only like if it's like a, a home goods company or something around, you know, home or fashion, then something like that makes a lot of sense. Our, our, Client portfolio is usually about 70, 30 B2B, B2C. Um, so obviously B2B doesn't make a whole lot of sense there. But uh, I think we have one client right now where we're doing some Pinterest around. Um, they're a, a window, like a home window company. So um, so yeah, when it makes sense, yeah, they're the, 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 then that's just more of a reflection of our own, you know, client portfolio more than anything. Yeah, got it. Okay. What about, I mean, speaking about your client portfolio, I mean, even in the introduction, I talked about the fact that you've worked with massive tech companies and uh, nonprofits, like I think it was Habitat for Humanity. Yeah. Uh, and then of course, you've got clients at all sorts of shapes and sizes. Does your strategy, I mean, how you tailor your social media strategy, does it does it change significantly from client to client? Uh, yeah, for sure. I mean, we're not a one size fits all. I mean, there's a lot of time and effort that goes into of that our, our first month of working with a client is all onboarding and sometimes a, a prospect will invest in what we call a social media blueprint before they make a final decision with us to kind of get a sense of like what are our what's because strategy is not free you know uh, and then we always say that like sometimes we'll get on introductory calls and they'll want like this deep strategy it's like hey that takes time like it's not easy you know if it were everybody would be doing it you know, we, we we spend 15 to 20 hours diving deep and developing a, a pretty extensive strategy for clients. So sometimes they like to see that before they make a long-term commitment. Um, so, um, so yeah, there's a lot that, that goes in. Everybody's a little bit different. I mean, there's some commonalities across clients in terms of, you know, you know, building audience and driving engagement, uh, you know, driving leads, driving sales but you know everybody's you know depending on what they're selling or what it is that they're doing those everything's uh, there's lots of variables you know there's some clients that are selling six figure consulting things and the life the customer life cycles you know 6 to 12 months so that looks very different than a company that's selling uh you know a, a 50 dollar widget that somebody makes a decision on in the moment so and everything in between so the type of content you create, what channels that we're on, how we leverage paid social, um, creating funnels. Um, there's a lot of nuance uh, to it based on what their particular situation is. So um, again, commonalities that certainly allow us to have some repeatable process, but um, you know, in most cases, most of the opportunities that come our way, you know, at least 75% of the effort that goes into developing a pitch deck for them or a strategy is coming from a place of 
newness that is specific to them. Yeah. How, how, um, how hard is it to stick to a strategy in today's environment? And and I might be making an assumption. I'd love to just sort of hear your thoughts on this. Cause if I think about social media over the last few years, it's changed pretty significantly. And in particular, you know, the impacts of AI are sort of uh, changing the landscape or at least the capabilities within in that landscape. So how do you think about, um, you know, how often do you revisit that strategy? And then where do you see social media? Or how, how do you see that evolving over the next year yeah. or two? Well, it's our job to stay on the cutting edge. That's why a company hires an agency. So they don't have to think about it. So, I mean, we're always having to kind of stay one step ahead of what's what's going on um, with social media technology. Um, so, you know, we're, we're naturally always thinking about what's new and, and how to adjust according for clients. One of, one of the favorite things I do or we do as an agency or the culture that I try to build is this idea of, I don't, I don't want to overwhelm my account managers too much. They need to have room to be creative, right? And when I think about creativity, it's really about when you're juggling six, seven, eight, nine different relationships, you can, it can be really easy to just kind of like paint by numbers. Like I got to get, I got to get these things done and just go and go and go and go on. I need my team to be able to have time every day where they can sit back for a half an hour and pick a client and be like, let me just think about these guys for a little bit. Let me turn everything else off and let me just think about what's going on with them and, and give them room to be creative. You know, I I don't care where, like for me, I get in the shower and I'm just in there and that's where I, I, when I'm showering or I'm driving, I get my best ideas. And it's because I'm not like, there's no interruptions, right? You know, it's like I'm in a place and I get the best ideas from those places. So it's like, I need my team to be able to do that. And we do that for our clients. And that's why they stay with us because we don't get comfortable and just do the same thing because that's what a lot of agencies do. And that's why you see a lot of businesses that feel the need to switch agencies every year or a couple of years. I'm trying to rid, I'm trying to not do that. I want them to stick with us, but we have to operate that way. So, so we do that naturally. Um, And then to your question around AI, um, it's, it's, it's super interesting. I don't think AI is ever going to completely replace creativity per se. Um, I think it's a tool. I think anybody that comes at it and says, you know, feels so threatened by it that they say it's dumb or it's never that they're, that's just them being worried about it replacing their jobs. We're smart enough to realize like it's a tool. And for us, you know, it's great at sparking the conversation, like give me an outline for this, or what about a framework for this? So it, Maybe it saves us some time with some of that early framework type of stuff, but ultimately it's a real human being that's going to have to take that and make it real and authentic and unique. So, um, so that's how we use it today um, for sure. Uh, what that'll look like in the future is, is definitely very interesting. Um, and it's our job to continue to stay on top of that and look at it. I think ultimately it doesn't matter how sophisticated it gets I think there's always going to be a place for creative agencies because even if it gets great at it, you still got to tell it what to do. You know, you still got to input it and you still got to say the right things and do the right things. And, you know, if you're just using it as it's spit out, then you're just doing what thousands or millions of other people are doing too. So there's still a level, I think, of a a human element that uh, smart businesses need to obviously um, have infused in what they put out in the world. Yeah. I actually, internally, we talk about this all the time, right? Because I I own a international staffing firm, right? And about 25% of our people are in administrative roles or executive assistant roles. And somebody actually asked me the other day, you know, are you concerned about your model? And I said, well, no, because I actually see AI as a human plus component, right? It's it's amplifying the potential of people. It's creating more um, capabilities and more productivity, but right. I don't see it eliminating people altogether. Sure. And I even think about this podcast, by the time anyone hears this podcast, it will have gone through three or four different AI tools, but it's still you and I talking as human right. beings and someone's still curating that experience out, outside of this. So I, I, I fully uh, embrace the perspective that you've just laid out. Sure. Uh, tell me about measurability, because this is, I mean, I, I will say from my perspective, it's always been difficult for me to understand, is social media working, especially when it's, um, you know, the way that I think about social, social media, at least the way that I use it is I'm trying to help speak to people's ch- challenges and problems. 
-hmm. but it does, there's not always a one-to-one -one relationship. Like I put up this LinkedIn post and next thing you know, I've got 10 new customers, right? So how do you think about measurement for your customers and what are some of the metrics that you see people commonly using? Yeah, again, it really depends on the business and 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 what how they define success. So the, look, there there are technology there are technology solutions that help um, navigate that a bit. Uh, certainly, um, so that's just like a tactical thing, making sure that your things are plugged in the right way and they're tracking the right way. You know, that's half of it. I think the other part of it is really just you know we need to make sure that we're working with businesses that are pretty buttoned up in all of the aspects of what they do. So. Um, I'll, I'll give a really basic crass kind of explanation when I used to work with smaller business. Actually, I, I do a little bit of this still like passion projects for uh, folks I either know that own small businesses that I know don't have access to folks like myself, but I like to do it because it's a little bit of my time and it goes a long way for them. So like a small business owner that's maybe running a landscaping business or something, and I've set them up with whether it's social media or some search marketing ads or whatever, the number one thing I tell them is that you better make sure that whoever's picking up that phone is asking the right questions. How did you find us? Yeah. Okay. And then, the, so they ask that, well, how did you find us? Oh, I found you online. Okay, great. No, that's not enough. Like that's not the right question, right? It's like, you got to dig deeper, you know? So it's, it's, so there's, there's some nuance to this. That, that's again, that's a really basic small business example of it, but you know, a business has to make sure that they're tracking the customer life cycle that they, whether it's a CRM, whether they have funnels built out, that uh, the sales team is asking the right questions and taking the right documentation so that, you know, for larger ticket items, you know, you're seeing what is happening with a decision maker from beginning to end that tells a very specific story. So some of that, you have to connect the dots sometimes for business owners. It's not going to be a direct, like to your point, it's not one-to-one -one in terms of we spent this, we get this. But if you can marry technology you can marry process um, and then ultimately, and assuming a business has the patience to let these things permeate, you know, we've learned over time to ask the right questions about businesses that are a good fit for us. Like if they expect their world to change in two, three months, that's a red flag for us, right? It's, it's, this is, it takes time, you know, it takes six months to really get these things going so that you can look back and see that lift. So typically what we find is that when clients, we pick the right clients, you have a good relationships, they give us the time to be successful. They're going to be able to look back six months and say, okay, there's, there are definite signs of growth in different ways. Like our engagement's up, our web traffic is up. We've drove, driven more leads. We're seeing more like, of course, it has something to do with this investment in social media. So, you know, we try to bridge the gap as much as possible to make it, relatively easy for business owners to look and say, this is a worthwhile investment. Um, but it's never an exact science. It's never going to be exact. Yeah, I no, I, I totally understand that. I think that's why I asked the question is it's, it's a, it's a topic every time social media comes up, measurement, understanding, like the value, the ROI, because we're also ROI driven. Yeah. Um, it, that is difficult um, uh, to do at first. Let's talk about your book, Anti-Agency. And I'm actually really intrigued first by the title, given the fact that you have an agency. Yeah. Uh, and the second piece is just maybe you just explain if someone were to pick up that book, what can they expect to take away from it? Sure. You know, I, yeah, I, I've, I've wrestled with the title at post writing it. Um, but the, the genesis of it was I've always been trying to buck the trend of traditional agency life internally and how we deliver what we do. Um and I, look, I'm not claiming that I've invented anything or there, that there aren't other agencies that do similar things, but I always wanted to do things differently. I, I wanted to I wanted to hold on to people longer than you typically do at agencies. I wanted to build a culture that wasn't typical of most agencies that I'd worked at. I wanted to be selective about who we work with. I didn't want to just take every client. Um, and I wanted just to build a culture around freedom, you know, giving people the freedom to live life on their terms. That's been my driving force. It was for me, I want to live a life of freedom. I wanted to go to my kids' bully game at 2.30 if I wanted to and not be chained to a desk or whatever or stuck in a corporate, you know, nine to five. And I you know, forget that. No, like to me, it's about the results. It's about getting the work done, doing great work. And I don't care where you are, when you do it or how you do it. Just do it well, you know, and deliver results and live your life on your terms. There's, to me, there's nothing more powerful 
than feeling like you have control over your life. And I wanted to, I wanted to have that for myself. I wanted to give it to everybody that would come on board with me. And I just felt like that was not a typical business model. Um, now, obviously the pandemic has really started to change mindsets around what a work week should look like and working remotely. So I think the world's starting to catch up to that a little bit, but I mean, we were doing this six years ago. So, um, so anti-agency was really that, like I'm trying to be the anti-agency, like to be different. Um, but ultimately really what the book is about and for, it's a passion project. It was for, I, did, I re, I'd reached a point when I hit that million dollar mark crying like a baby because I never thought I could ever do that. Um, and I immediately thought to myself, well, geez, if I could do this, anybody can like, you know, and I felt like I had a pretty unique path to getting there and a lot of struggle and a lot of failure. And I learned so many things. I'm like, I just felt this overwhelming sense of like, I have to put this in a, I have to create something and put it out in the world so that other people can get to where I am at and maybe not have it take as long or, or maybe help motivate them and inspire them to do this thing that they think is unobtainable. So that was why, that was my why. And um, yeah, I mean, that, that, that's, that's really why I did it. And I, you know, I, you know, I wish, you know, I'm not some huge, massive Stephen King bestseller author. So I've learned a lot about, you know, the publishing process and, and what goes into that and what it takes for a book to be successful. But you know, I've had a lot of everybody that's read it has nothing but glowing things to say about it. I've, I've, I use it as a tool. I spend time on Reddit helping other entrepreneurs. I always, I give it out for free, you know, and I, this is my weakness is, is I am very generous probably with my time to a fault. And, um, look, you don't make money making books unless you're, you know, a massive author. So it's, to me, that's not what it's about. It's just, for me, it's just a sense of accomplishment of I've left this thing in the world and, when I'm long gone, I, I hope that it's something that, you know, leaves a mark on enough people and it has made a difference in their life. And that's all that it ever is, then it was worth it. Awesome. I appreciate that. And I, I and by the way, I just note for the the people that are listening, uh, it is on available on Amazon.com has a perfect five-star rating. But uh, Jason, when I was doing my research for this show, something came up and I'm just curious. Uh, how did you choose you, you actually say that every book purchased supports, yeah. um, a, a cause that I'm assuming that you're passionate about. How did you choose that? Uh, so yeah, that's, uh, it's the, um, uh, I'm having a brain for our DVS, uh, domestic violence services of Snohomish County, the County that I live in. Um, it's something both my wife and I have always been passionate about. I grew up with a single mom, so I have a, a special place in my heart for, for, I mean, look, any single parent, but usually single moms for me is a soft spot just because I, I grew up in that type of environment. So when I see, you know, women that are struggling or going through, like, I just, that's to me, like a really important thing to support. So we've, we've supported that over the years. And um, I do a lot of, we do a lot of, we donate money and time and we participate in their events. And I'm actually in the middle of working on a, a video for them for their next big event early next year. But uh, that, that's why I selected it. And I figured, you know, why not, you know, you know, associate that with this because it's part of my, it's part of my story. So yeah, uh, so to me, it was a no brainer. I love it. Yeah. Um, let's talk real quickly. I mean, we're getting close to the end of the time, but I just two quick questions for you. One, I want to talk about uh, talent and workspace because you made a comment a minute ago that's something I'm actually very passionate about yep. the second is and finally we'll wrap up with what you're trying to learn personally today just to grow yourself but let's start with the first one which is you know um, both of my companies are fully remote organizations and something that we embraced early and we believe is uh, for us a key component of our our brand yep. um, but you know I'm making the transition because at one point I had people all in one office in downtown Bellevue, Washington, right next door to Microsoft. <laughs> and then now we are distributed in uh, six different countries and in 14 different states. <sighs> Creating culture uh, and training and onboarding is so different when you're all in one office because you can kind of be sloppy. you know you'd say sit next to Jason for the next two weeks, learn your job and you'll be off and running. When you're in a remote environment, it's very different. And so is the way that you build connections and community and some of the stickiness that keeps people in organizations outside of just compensation. Yeah. Um, how do you guys think about building culture in your business when you're also in a remote, remote environment? What, what do you think are sort of the critical aspects for you? 
Yeah, there's a lot that goes into it. I think it starts with hiring the right people, which is not an easy thing to do. If there's a superpower that I gained from my experience at Microsoft was they put me through the gauntlet when it comes to recruiting and hiring and interviewing. So I learned a lot from them that really put me in a position to do that well. So you got to get the right people. I always say, you know, you got to hire for the untrainable traits. Do they just possess, you know, just who they are as a person and, and, and what they're capable of naturally um, is really the focus. Like you can teach somebody how to use a piece of software. Um, so though, you know, just making sure that you're making really good decisions about who you bring in. A lot of that, again, has to do with, is this a person that can thrive in a remote environment? You know, it's not for everybody. Um, so getting that part right is probably the most critical component. We've gotten that wrong. I think we've gotten better at it now, but we've gotten that wrong. Um, the second part, it goes back to what I was saying earlier, is just, is, is trust and freedom. You know, when you give people the power to run their own life, I believe that great work is born from that. If they feel like they get to like decide how they work, where they work, when they work, for the most part, um, within reason, they're going to do great things for you. You know, so there's there's a trust part there, and that's that's been a tough thing. And it's, it's it's taken time for us to navigate that. And like, not don't go too far. Don't pull reel it in too much. Figuring out like what kind of process and things you have to put in place. So that people can appreciate that, and but that's that's been a huge part of us holding on to people longer than you typically do at an agency, and then also you know them just doing great work because they value receiving that and, and being able to live that type of life, um, and then it's just you know you got to work at it. You know we we try to do you know we use tools like Slack, and we we just had our first company retreat um, this past summer, so we got everybody together, and it was a huge moment to like make our relationships more concrete by by seeing each other so i think you know if you have a remote business any chance you can to at least sprinkle that in every once in a while is an important component um and i think you just add all those things together and uh it just it, it can work it's just you have to kind of think about it differently like uh you can't you know and, and just you know, it's, it's funny when you're in a traditional office environment, it's very easy to just walk by and have a conversation. So when you think about Slack, it's like, well, what, what's the equivalent of that? It's basically you have to like click on a person's name. Hey, how you doing? Right. So it's like, you know, you kind of have to think a little bit differently about how to replicate that sort of thing. So yeah. again, we're not perfect at it, but I think we've, we've figured out a lot and, and it works for us. Yeah, I think there's two things you said that I, that I'll just call out. One is hiring people that can work in a remote environment is a critical component because I think people underestimate if they're doing it for the first time, they underestimate. Yeah, it's nice not to go to work, but it's also a different environment. You don't have the water cooler talk. The social connection is different, right? And you have to sort of intentionally do that, which is the point number two. I love how you said, like, you look at your Slack channel, you got you have to intentionally think, I'm going to reach out to this person so that we can connect versus accidental water cooler talk that just happens through osmosis, right? So yeah, for sure. cool. Uh, let's talk lastly about just your own development. My, my What I've I've known about entrepreneurs in general is we're, we're typically insatiable learners. Uh, yeah. What is something you're trying to learn about today or interested in that is sort of helping grow you as an individual or leader? Yeah, I I mean I I'm uh to a fault pretty um pretty uh I'm not cocky or arrogant. I'm very uh I can't think of the word. I'm very um humble. humble. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes to a fault probably. My team tells me that's but that that's also a strength. Um so I'm always thinking about how I can do things better. I always tell I always tell these guys I, my team will make fun of me all the time. Like I I like getting out in front of problems before they happen, and I think that's a big part of why we've been successful. So I over worry about things. I think when things aren't trending in the right direction, I I feel it a little bit more than I probably should allow myself to. Um, so for me, it, a lot of learning around how do I you know navigate you know, business challenges or things that are stressful in a way that still allows me to kind of be that proactive problem solver, but not feel too much weight about it. Uh, Cause nine times out of 10, I typically, you know, when whatever that thing is resolves itself, it was, it, it was never as bad as I was projecting it to be. So I just feel like sometimes I might wait, I, I might be wasting 
mind share on things to a degree that I don't need to. So like, how do I better manage those sorts of things? Um, and then also how do I balance being this generous kind of like different kind of leader with, you know, what, what's the balance between like making hard choices and, and being a little bit more um, firm, I guess, uh, around what needs to happen to grow the business versus, you know, trying to, you know, continue to be like this different kind of like, we just have such a, a unique dynamic in this business. I've never felt like I've ever really had to stray from that type of leadership style. I mean, and a lot, again, a lot of that has to do with hiring the right people. If you hire great people, they don't need, you know, a lot of, um, you know, handholding or, or there's just not a lot of negative like situations. So, um, but you know, we've been like this consistent business and we could, we could be making more money than we are if we did things differently. So it's like that balance of like, should I be doing things a little bit differently to help with the health of the business or is the team just content? Like they're happy. They're living a life of freedom. Yeah. Maybe they can make more money elsewhere, but they're probably not going to have the health, the overall health that they have right now. And I think they've, a lot of them value that and see that. So it's, those are the kinds of things that dance around my head, you know, yeah. that's what I'm trying to work through. I think. One of the things that you, you commented on earlier that made me, that you sort of revisited there a second ago too, is that you hire good people and you give them sort of the freedom uh, you can build a great business and, 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 and it doesn't have to take, take it, take over your life. Right. Like yeah. that's okay. It reminds me of the Netflix culture where they say, Hey, uh, freedom and extreme accountability. Those are their two values, right? That's how we grow our business. And sounds like you guys are sort of following a very similar path in terms yeah. of the culture you're trying to build. Yeah, well, for sure. Very cool. Well, I think we'll leave it there. Uh, we've been talking to Jason Yorkman, the CEO and founder of Socialistics. Jason, if people want to learn more about your business, where can they go? Yeah, uh, they can find us at socialistics.com or if they want to learn more about, um, you know, my book or things of that nature, uh, my personal site is uh, jasonyourmark.com. Awesome. We will get those uh, in the um, show notes. So they're there for uh, those that, that come a little bit later, but appreciate you being on the show today. Yeah, enjoyed it. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to the Future is Borderless podcast with David Nilsson. Be sure to click subscribe to future episodes so you can hear from more top entrepreneurs and thought leaders. And we'll see you again next time.